right, friends, welcome to you all around the world. Welcome to Follow the Money Radio. So grateful to have you here along for the ride. My name is Jerry Robinson. I'm an economist and author of the book, Bankruptcy of Our Nation. I am the founder here at followthemoney.com, a trading coach, helping a lot of people around the world when it comes to learning how to trade successfully, learning how to invest. We love to talk about that here at followthemoney.com. We not only have a free section of our website, but we have a vast membership section as well. You can learn all about that on our website, followthemoney.com forward slash join. You can learn all about our uh, great membership program that we have. Kind of like a trading club, an investing club for those who are looking for a community and looking for constant new ideas when it comes to trading and investing. Now, I'm really excited about today's uh, show. Today, what we're going to be doing is empowering you to take control of your financial destiny, right? We really have something truly special for you in store. We're diving into eight powerful tips today for achieving financial independence. And whether you're just getting started on your journey or you're looking to level up your financial game, these eight tips uh, in this podcast episode are going to guide you towards the path of success, right? So we're going to be talking about that. You can see today's episode, episode number 441, uh, Master Your Money, Eight Tips for Achieving Financial Independence. You know, we could probably talk about many more than eight tips in today's uh, podcast episode, but just for the sake of time, we're going to limit it to eight. And by the way, you can find a lot of great information in our book, Bankruptcy of Our Nation. We have lots of financial tips inside of there. All of our members have access to that book, or you can always get it, a copy of it on uh, Amazon or right there on our own website. But we've talked about many of these topics over the years. And as I've stated, some of these you may already be familiar with, but others, I think no matter where you are in your financial life, all of these tips will be helpful to you. And many of them are going to be intuitive. So let's just begin with tip number one. And that is to separate your needs from your wants, right? This is really obvious, but at the same time, it's not so obvious when it comes to practicality. Sometimes we don't actually listen to our better judgment. So one of the fundamental steps to mastering your money is learning to separate your financial needs from your financial wants. It's easy to blur the lines between these two in today's consumer-driven society. But here's the thing. Your needs are the essentials, the things that you cannot live without, food, shelter, clothing. And the cost of that, of all of those things, all of those needs have gone up You know, in the age of very, very high inflation in the wake of COVID, in the response of the government to uh, you know, to, to COVID. We've seen a tremendous amount of inflation uh, that has really seeped into all segments of society, but particularly our needs like food and shelter, right? These things have gone up tremendously. So, you know, these are the things that we need. But on the other hand, you have wants. These are the extras. This is the consumer discretionary sector, so to speak. We have consumer staples, which are your needs, and then you have consumer discretionary. This is, you know, this is what you want. And your wants are the extra things. These are things that bring temporary satisfaction, these are things that don't necessarily contribute to your long-term financial well-being. Perfect example. Uh, so, you know, I have uh, three young boys. We recently went out and got, well, it was a couple of years ago, but we went out and we bought a brand new vehicle. We needed a new vehicle. And obviously, when you're looking at the car lot, you see some nice luxury sedans and you see, you know, different types of vehicles that you might want. But then you think, what do I really need? You know, if you, if you have three young boys uh, and, you know, and they're in, still in car seats, well, what do you need? Well, you need a minivan, right? So you may want something else. You may say, well, I want this or I want that. But what you really need is a utility vehicle, something that provides a lot of utility, something that's easy to get in and out of, something that's good for long trips with, you know, w- with three young boys. And so, you know, therefore, in my own case, you know, I may have wanted a luxury sedan or a nice convertible or, you know, but what I, but what I needed was a minivan. So, you know, we bought a nice, large, very roomy minivan and it's been a great decision. But the point is, is that, you know, oftentimes we can let our wants override our needs and then you end up with something that may be impractical and then ends up costing you more in the long run. So, you know, how do we put this tip into action in your own life? Well, start by creating a budget. 
that clearly distinguishes between your needs and your wants, right? Many people don't even have a budget. That's a very, very important tip here. But you want to track your expenses and you want to ask yourself, you know, is this a true need or is this just a want? And you want to challenge yourself to make conscious choices that prioritize your needs uh, while still allowing some room for the occasional wants. And, you know, the way I think about it is one of the rules we even have here in in our own home is that if we're, you know, my wife or I are wanting to buy something, uh, we'll typically take 24 hours and wait before we purchase it uh, to make sure that we, it really is something that we need or something that we're really going to use, or if it's a want, especially that it's, you know, that it's something that we have thought about and not just, you know, impulsive buying, which happens, you know, too often uh, in our consumer driven society. The other thing too about wants is that you can buy used once. So when it comes to needs, you know, sure, you can buy things that are used, but when it comes to once, maybe, you know, I was just looking recently for a new punching bag, you know, for my exercise routine, or I was looking for, you know, maybe a power rack. Well, you can go out and buy those brand new, you know, on Amazon, you can buy it right now, they ship it right to your door, you know, but you can save money if you go on to uh, Facebook marketplace, or you go on to, you know, some local online seller, and you can find, you know, some of that stuff for half the price. And so obvi- this is an obvious thing, but when it comes to your wants, consider buying used once when possible. And probably the most important takeaway from this is you don't want to go broke trying to impress broke people. You know, a lot of times we get ourselves in trouble with our wants, buying things that we want subconsciously because we're trying to impress other people. But what other people think of you is none of your business, right? And so you don't want to think about that. That can really harm your financial success over time. So stay focused and uh, if really focus on you know separating the wants and the needs. I remember the wise words of uh, Zig Ziglar, big motivational speaker, very popular, uh, who once said, money isn't the most important thing in life but it's reasonably close to oxygen on the gotta have it scale, right? So we want to take charge of our finances by separating our needs and our wants, and this will ensure financial security and set the stage for our journey to financial independence. All right, so there's number one, separate wants from needs. Tip number two is be afraid of bad debt, not good debt, right? So when it comes to debt, it really helps to create a clear distinction in your mind between what bad debt is and what good debt is. So let's explain. Bad debt includes things like high interest credit cards, consumer loans, especially payday loans, for example, and excessive student loans that can drag you down and keep you trapped in a cycle of payments whenever you really didn't plan out your college very well. You know, many people, and let's just talk about student loan debt for a minute, because you can actually have good student loan debt. It's not really a bad debt, but it can be a bad debt. How can it be a bad debt? Perfect example, somebody who goes to college, they get right out of high school and they have no idea what they want to study. They haven't taken any time to find out if there's any kind of, of scholarships or tuition assistance, and they just immediately plow into a four year degree to get a degree that they later are going to decide, I don't really want that degree. But then they they took on lots and lots and lots of student loans to get it. They had no idea why they were in college. They were going because they were 18. That's what everybody does. All my friends are going to college. I'm going to go to college. What are you going to get? What's your degree? Uh, I don't know. I'll just pick it. So they end up just picking something and then spending tremendous amounts of money. And then they get out and say, I don't even use this degree. You know, okay, that's an example of bad debt. Okay, bad debt. Bad debt is when you go to college and you spend tremendous amounts of money, and you have no idea why you're there, okay? On the other hand, there is good debt. A good debt would be things like loans that can potentially increase your net worth or generate income for you, uh, such as a home loan, a business loan, uh, or even certain, as I mentioned, certain student loans. I had a friend whenever I was in uh, high school who wanted to be a dentist, I had another friend who wanted to be a chiropractor. They just knew in high school. They're like, this is what I want to do. And so they went to college and guess what they did? They went to become a dentist or they went to become a chiropractor. They took on debt, but guess what? They were ready for it and they prepared for it. And they have, they had a lot of student loan debt getting out, even though they had some tuition assistance and some scholarships, they still had tuition that they had to pay and some bills, you know, pretty expensive going to become a chiropractor or 
Those of you who become a dentist, you know it's expensive. But that's the good kind of debt because when they got out, they had a plan. They wanted to be the dentist. They wanted to be the chiropractor. They set up practice and they paid off their debt, right? So in other words, that's not a bad thing. Like if you want to be a doctor, well, you don't really have a choice. You got to go get a student loan, you know? I mean, it's going to be expensive otherwise, unless you got gobs of cash, you know, coming out your ears. So you're going to have to borrow money. That's fine if you have a plan. But if you don't have a plan, right? You're just like, I got to go to college because everybody else does. No, that's not a good plan. You don't want to go spend a bunch of money to find out that you don't really need this degree for what you actually want to do in life later. So I think a lot of people just go to school too quickly. They just immediately go to college without a plan. I think it's, I think that can be unwise. So we're talking about good debt and bad debt here. Be afraid of bad debt, but don't be afraid of good debt. Um, and it, bad debt can be likened to say quicksand, right? Slowly suffocates your financial freedom. Good debt, however, can be a powerful tool when you use it wisely and strategically, it can help you acquire assets. Um, you know, I, I couldn't have bought the uh, rental homes that I own now without debt. So this is good debt, right? I, it's, it's good debt. Uh, invest in your education. As we had talked about, you, you can't become a doctor without taking on student loans. I mean, the, the average person can't. Uh, and so, you know, that's a good debt if you know what you want to do. Uh, start a business. I mean, many people can't start a business without a loan. Uh, and that that business can generate income and help you pay that loan. So, um, and, and you know, again, I, I talk about the rental, uh, in, uh, rental properties that we have. Imagine you're considering purchasing a, a real estate property for rental purposes using a mortgage, and that falls underneath the good debt kind of uh, category. And this property is going to generate what? Monthly rental income. It's going to cover the mortgage payments. It's going to provide extra cash flow for you to put in your pocket or to put into a rainy day fund in case you need to fix that, that property in the future. But over time, as the property appreciates, your equity in that house is growing uh, and you're building wealth while the tenants pay off your mortgage, right? So that's an example of good debt if you know what you're doing. So be cautious of bad debt and leverage good debt intelligently so that you can prepare, you know, propel yourself towards uh, financial independence. All right, so there's tip number two. You know, really discern between good debt and bad debt and be afraid of bad debt, but don't be afraid of good debt. All right. Tip number three here in today's podcast episode, we're moving right along. Uh, tip number three, make investing a habit. This is such an important topic that I've actually done an entire course on this for our members. And I just want to say this to you, no matter who you are out there, whatever you do, don't stop investing. Don't stop investing. It needs to be a habit that you constantly do. You want to make it a non-negotiable habit, just like brushing your teeth. Hopefully everybody brushes their teeth, just like eating breakfast. Uh, you want to invest consistently over time. That's the key to building wealth and achieving financial independence by staying focused upon your long-term goals and letting time work its magic, you will have uh, a much larger pie at the end that you'll be able to divvy up in time of, re of retirement than you would if you didn't invest regularly, right? So Warren Buffett once said, someone's sitting in the shade today because someone planted a tree a long time ago, right? That tree represents the habit of consistent investing. So by putting your investments on autopilot, which is even better, whether it's your 401k or whether it's your IRA or your brokerage account, you're planting the seeds for a brighter financial future, right? Now, along the way, inevitably, this is what comes up. People will say, well, you know, I have this financial challenge or I've got a cash crunch here and I don't know what to do. Well, remember, when times get tough, cutting back on your investing should be your last resort. It's far better to reduce your investment contributions temporarily than to eliminate them altogether. Because this actually causes you to break the habit of investing. So the, the habit of investing that I teach and that you know is very, I think, just very popular, the dollar cost averaging strategy for the average investor is the very best way to go. Where every week or every month or every two weeks or every, how, whatever, regu, you know, whatever uh, time frame you want to base it on, you're just regularly investing a little bit uh, 
over a very long period of time, just a habit, just a drip, 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 constant investing. And by maintaining that habit of investing, you preserve the momentum and discipline that will help lead you to financial success over time. So you want to make investing a habit, right? That lasts a lifetime. You keep it on autopilot. You ignore the noise. Many people won't invest uh, because they say, well, I don't know what's going to happen. Well, it doesn't really matter what's going to happen tomorrow or the next day because you're saving for your retirement. So you need to be investing now. We don't really care what's going to happen tomorrow. We need to save money and put it away so we'll have purchasing power 20, 30, 40 years from now, right? So every young person listening to me today, if there was anything that I could do on this whole list that I would do differently, is I would go back to the time whenever I was 18 and I would start investing right there with my, with my, and not stop. So I would invest for a little bit and then I would stop. And then I would invest for a little bit and then I would stop. And then sometimes I would say, well, I need to take that money. I need to borrow because I didn't have any savings when I was very young. So I would have to go take money out of my 401k to pay for things. Well, this is terrible. So the point is, is to start investing. Don't stop. Don't stop. Even if you have to cut back your investing to say 1%, of your pay of your paycheck, right? Uh, even if it's just one percent, while you know during a temporary setback that you have or a cash crunch, that's fine. One percent, but don't stop investing, because the minute you stop investing, then years can go by where you forget to invest or you just don't get around to. So you have to start the habit, and you've got to keep the habit, even if it's low, even if it's small amount. The habit is what we're after. We're don't focus upon, well, I'm only putting back $100. What difference is going to make? That's not the point. The point is, is that you are regularly putting that back. And it may be $100 today, but it may be $1,000 five years from now. You just don't want to stop the habit of regularly putting money away into an investment account. And you, you know, put it on autopilot, ignore the noise, uh, and cut other habits before you even consider cutting your investments, right? So there may be other habits that you can cut, right? Maybe you've got a daily Frappuccino that you buy. You know, it's costing you 80 bucks a month. Well, there you go. Cut that habit. Don't cut the investing habit, right? So when it comes to cutting habits, don't cut investing as a habit. You want to keep that so you can forge your path towards financial independence. Okay, that's tip number three. Let's move on to tip number four. We're moving right along. The eight different strategies, eight different tips here for achieving financial independence. Tip number four, stay liquid. Keep at least six months of income in, in savings at all times. Okay, so that we've been teaching this for a long time. And you, and you may not be at a place where you have six months saved right this second. Uh, and that's okay, but you can get there. That needs to be a big priority. Why? Because life is full of unexpected twists and turns. And having a financial cushion can make all the difference. That's why it's crucial to keep six months worth of, of your income in savings at all times. This emergency fund uh, acts like your safety net, and it provides peace of mind during challenging times. If you were to suddenly face a job loss or an unexpected medical expense or a major home repair, you know, having that well-padded emergency fund is going to allow you to weather those storms without resorting to high interest credit card debt or some other consumer loan that you have to take on or to make other hasty financial decisions like like I used to have to do whenever I was younger I would you know I would put money in my 401k but I didn't really save much and so when I when a really big thing came up you know like a big home repair or if I lost my job well I had to cash out the 401k to cover those expenses right so you really don't want to have to do that. So you, you want to think of your emergency fund like a lifeboat in a turbulent sea. It's, it's a protection for you against unforeseen waves it's, that could potentially capsize your financial stability. So when you stay liquid, it allows you to circ circumnavigate those unexpected things that can kind of come up and, and it helps you navigate them with confidence and to maintain control over your financial destiny. Also, by staying liquid and having a robust emergency fund, you can focus on helping others, right? You can make a positive impact without worrying about financial setbacks derailing your progress. So 
I would encourage you to make it a top priority to build and maintain a six-month emergency fund, right? Continually contributing to it, even if it means starting with small amounts. Every dollar counts when it comes to your financial security and peace of mind. We actually have a free, uh, a very powerful uh, free report on this topic that you go to uh, our website. You can find it. It's followthemoney.com forward slash uh, DSL forward slash DSL. There we discuss our diversified six month liquid s saving strategy. Really interesting uh, study we did. And then also you, you can also learn more about saving by going to followthemoney.com forward slash save. Uh, you'll learn much there. We've talked about saving a lot, but the key is to get six months of your income in savings and then you keep it at all times, right? So therefore, if you ever have to, you ever have an emergency, you don't have to tap your investments, but instead you've got that uh, emergency fund, which also serves as a, a pool of uh, opportunity capital, you know, as you need it. All right. So we got four more tips we're going to talk about on the other side of this break. I want to come back and talk about four more tips that you can use to achieve financial independence. We'll be right back on the other side of this break. Hey friends, it's Jerry Robinson here from Follow the Money Radio. You know, we just launched a very exciting live weekly webcast called Trends and Profits that I want you to be a part of. It is part of our membership. You have to be a member here at followthemoney.com to be able to enjoy this webcast. But what we do in this webcast is we provide you every week with valuable insights, uh, trend alerts, actionable investing and trading ideas. And then you also have the opportunity to get your questions answered during our member Q&A segment. Each episode of the Trends and Profits webcast, which is every single week, is thoughtfully crafted to deliver four segments that will empower you to make smarter investment decisions. We begin with a news brief, helping you stay up to date with the latest market news that could impact your investment strategies. We analyze the current events and economic data and geopolitical trends to help you navigate this ever-changing market landscape. In segment two, we move into trend alerts and help you stay ahead of the curve with our trend alerts. We share our expert analysis and market trends. We identify key opportunities and potential pitfalls, and we help you discover those emerging trends so you can unlock potential profits. And then in in segment three of our new weekly webcast, we tackle actionable investing and trading ideas. So when you're ready to take action, this is the perfect segment for you. We present actionable ideas and strategies designed to help you capitalize on market trends from stock picks to ETF trading strategies, crypto ideas. You'll receive practical guidance to help you achieve your financial goals. And then in our fourth segment, we spend time answering your questions, which matter to us greatly. We believe in the power of community and fostering a supportive learning environment. So during our member Q&A segment of our weekly live webcast, we address your specific queries. We provide insights and offer some general advice to help you overcome any hurdles you may face in your investing or trading journey. So our brand new Trends and Profits webcast for members only, I encourage you to check it out. You've got to be a member here. Of course, you got to go to followthemoney.com forward slash join. Become a member today. Start your seven day free trial. Check it out. If you want to be a better investor, a better trader, you want good ideas delivered to you in your inbox every single single day, follow the money. That's where you want to go. Follow the money.com forward slash join. We're here for you. We want to help you in 2023. I'll see you on the other side. friends. Welcome back to Follow the Money Radio. Grateful to have you here. We are in episode number 441, Master Your Money, Eight Tips for Achieving Financial Independence. We've already gone through the first four. We've talked about tip number one, separating your financial needs from your financial wants in your mind, clearly. Uh, number two, we, the second tip was to be afraid of bad debt, but not good debt. Uh, tip number three, very important, to make investing a habit. Whatever you do, don't stop investing regularly. Tip number four is to stay liquid. 
by keeping six months of liquid savings uh, at all times. We talked about that. Now, what we want to do is we want to continue on. We have eight of these tips, so we're going to move in now to the last four, the, the last half. And we're going to begin with tip number five. And this one's a really important one that I've learned over the years is to tip number five, don't settle for one income stream in your working years, right? Don't settle for one income stream in your working years. The, here's the truth. Relying upon one income stream, solely upon one income stream during your working years can severely limit your financial potential. It's time to break free from that mindset and to create multiple streams of income. I want you to think of these streams as the rivers that flow into your financial reservoir that ensure a steady flow of wealth over time. So you may be thinking, well, how do I create multiple streams of income? Well, let me just share a few ideas from uh, our own uh, you know, our own members here, our own students that I've seen over the years, we've helped countless people over the last decade or more uh, to achieve multiple streams of income. We even have here for our members an income university that covers 20, more than 20 different income streams that you can create both now and in retirement. Let me give you a few ideas just to get your creative juices flowing. One of them is trading. Uh, many in our audience uh, have heard us talk about trading. I've been a trader now for many, many years, trend trading, uh, more than 20, 20 years now. And I've been coaching people about trading for the last 13 years. And when, when we think about trading, you know, we think about, well, how will we do that? Well, we may have money in an, in an account, like a 401k, an IRA. We, want, we have a long-term investing strategy. That's great. Well, what we can do is we can take a portion of that money, typically no more than 10 or 20%, and we can use that to trade to, to improve the overall returns over time. Now, obviously, in the beginning, you're not going to be that great of a trader. Nobody is. They learn how to trade. So this is something that you would learn to do, like riding a bike. And once you learn it, it's a very, very powerful skill. So trading in the financial markets, whether you're trading uh, stocks, whether you're trading ETFs, whether you're trading options or currencies or cryptocurrencies or whatever the case might be, commodities, this can be a very powerful thing for you. And trading trends in particular is one of the most powerful because once you learn it, you can really apply it to almost any financial market. So trading obviously is a major, major way to boost income. It could be a second stream of income for you in addition to your job or your business, whatever your main stream of income is. You can also explore the opportunities of rental real estate. So you can, you can slowly begin building a rental, re residential uh, real estate rental income by buying a property, fixing it up, uh, and then moving somebody in or buying a new house and you know, ha having renters move into it. Uh, and this can be a very powerful way. And there's all kinds of ways to do it. I mean, you don't have to just buy the house and then move somebody in. You could buy the house, move into it for a year you know, or two fix it up, whatever, and then move out and do it again and rent that house out. That's actually a kind of a cheaper way to do it if you don't want to put a large down payment down. But so you do have that strategy. Uh, and we've seen many people do that in our audience. Uh, also, I'm thinking right now of one of our uh, long-term uh, members, uh, long-time members, who has been a real big help to us at our live summits that we do, uh, a family that began... Uh, dabbling in tax liens. They began dabbling in tax liens. That is going to tax lien auctions and buying uh, tax liens and earning a good income from those as a part-time income. But eventually they actually landed, uh, uh, they bought a tax lien or deed, I forget which, which one it was, in a particular state, I believe it was New Mexico. And they were able to purchase a, a, a motel uh, through this tax lien. So that it really worked out well for them. Now they have a motel. They had no idea they were ever going to be in this business. And now they were able to quit their jobs and to focus specifically on real estate, all because they began dabbling for part-time income in tax liens. We teach that right here on our website, followthemoney.com. You can learn about that. We, it's amazing what people have done over the years with our resources. Uh, you can explore wholesaling real estate. Maybe you don't have a whole lot of money, but you say, I want to wholesale real estate. We have a whole course, a couple of courses on wholesaling real estate. That's a way to get in real estate without any money, right? Or you can get involved in direct sales. 
or you can become an affiliate marketer, right? We've helped a lot of people become affiliate marketers over the years. Huge. We, in fact, we even have an affiliate marketing uh, plan right here at Follow the Money. So if you're out there listening to us and you say, well, I'd like to promote Follow the Money uh, and earn an income, well, we do that. So you can always reach out to us. Reach out to us, followthemoney.com forward slash contact if you want to learn more about our own affiliate program here at followthemoney.com. But uh, affiliate marketing is another really powerful way to generate income on the side, right? It takes time. You got to learn what you're doing. You know, it's not instant success, but nothing is. I mean, that's how it works. You got to learn uh, how to ride a bike before you can, you know, go out and compete. Uh, and then one of the most obvious ones and probably the most easiest way is just to sell stuff online, right? So whenever I was much younger, I would, I would sell things online. Uh, one of the very first businesses I started was an online book business. Uh, I've talked about it before where I would, I would find all kinds of books at, at auctions or, you know, uh, estate sales, Oh, I even found one big organization institution that had a really big book sale. I bought all their books and I had a storage and I was selling books on Amazon, making a full time living. I mean, it was crazy. Uh, you know, so you can do this. I mean, you can do stuff on eBay. You can do stuff on Facebook Marketplace. You can sell some. Most people have enough stuff in their garage to sell the last in the first year. You know, most people have too much stuff. Um, so you can definitely start earning a side income. And that side income, you can earmark towards certain things, whether it's financial needs that you have on your list. You can earmark it for your six-month liquid savings. You can earmark it for investing. Say every dollar I make from this is going to go into my investment fund, or it's going to go towards buying real estate, whatever the case might be. The key is uh, the possibilities are vast, but it's about finding the right avenues that align with your skills, your interests, your goals, your education, your experience. And as you create multiple streams of income, you begin to challenge the status quo and expand your financial horizons. You build resilience. You diversify your revenue sources. You unlock potential for exponential wealth growth. This is all in your power. These are things that you can do. You can embrace the power of multiple income streams. You can let creativity and the entrepreneurial spirit soar as you discover new opportunities to increase your cash flow. Right. So if you have one income stream right now and you're listening to me, I want to challenge you develop a second income stream in 2023. Don't let this year go by without saying I'm going to develop a second income stream. And if you have two income streams and it's all working out, OK, then consider adding a third. Right. In other words, you're looking to add more income streams in your life. It's a very, very powerful strategy. Okay, that's tip number five, create multiple streams of income. Tip number six, get a second opinion. Get a second opinion. So when it comes, and I'm talking here about financial advice, get a second opinion on your current financial strategy. What are you currently doing? What's your retirement strategy? Uh, how, when are you gonna retire? Uh, where are you investing? What are you investing in? What's it going to look like 20 years from now? What, what is your strategy going to do for you 10 years from now? You need a second opinion. So you want to talk to uh, someone who is a financial advisor. And here's the deal. I get it. When it comes to seeking financial advice, not every advisor is worth the money. I get it. I mean, I know. I, for for uh, a few years, whenever I was uh, out of, uh, of the university with economics, I was doing economic consulting and then I began to move into financial advising. Well, I quickly found that I was not happy as a financial advisor per se, but I found that I really gravitated towards life insurance. I saw life insurance as one of the most powerful ways to turbocharge uh, a, a financial plan, but also to lay a proper foundation. So I really just kind of focused in on life insurance and life insurance strategies. And that's really where I am today. I still, you know, uh, practice uh, life insurance even to this day because I find it to be so compelling. It's such an incredible tool that so many people ignore um, it, it, to their own peril. But, uh, but anyway, here's my point. When I, when I say, hey, you want to go talk to a financial advisor, I know that many people say, well, you know, uh, you know, I, I don't know if I really want somebody to really look at all my finances. I don't know if I'm comfortable with that. Or are they even going to get it? You know, are they going to really know? Are they going to really help me? 
This is why it's essential to take time to interview a prospective financial advisor, because not every advisor is worth the money. It's true, right? A lot of, a lot of financial advisors won't get you. They won't, they won't understand your goals. They may not listen to your concerns, or they may not have the knowledge and experience that are needed to guide you on your path to financial independence. So how do you find the right financial advisor? Well, you start by looking for someone who uh, has a thirst for knowledge, uh, has, exhibits curiosity, uh, has a genuine interest in your financial well-being, but who isn't solely focused upon making a quick buck, right? So this would probably uh, rule out many new advisors who are just getting started, who don't have a whole lot of experience. And while they may have great hearts and they may really want to help, they, they may be driven by something else besides your, your well-being. Okay, I, I can't prove that. Uh, I don't know that to be the case. But I've found that over time, those who, uh, who have been doing it for many years are no longer in that hungry state where they just want anybody you know, who has a pulse. I'll, I'll work with anybody. No, th- over time, as a financial advisor becomes successful, he can choose who he does business with. He's not desperate to do business with you. If he's successful, he's not de- you, you should be desperate to do business with him. He's going to be a help to you. He's going he's to advise you, and he's going to be your money guy. So, you know, the best investment you can make is in yourself. You've heard that before. Well, by seeking out a knowledgeable and trustworthy financial advisor, you're investing in yourself. You're investing in your financial future because they can provide you valuable insights. A good financial advisor can help you navigate complex financial decisions. They can help you keep track of your goals and to reach them. And so this is why I think it's so important to get a second opinion. You may already have a financial advisor, or maybe you maybe you had a financial advisor in the past and you said, well, it didn't help me, or I, I felt like I was spending too much money or too many fees or whatever. Again, I get it. Um, you know, But seeking a second opinion doesn't mean that you lack knowledge. It doesn't mean that you lack skill. It means that you value expertise and you're willing to tap into the wisdom of others, right? So that's a really powerful tip. And by the way, uh, we created many years ago a network of financial advisors that we knew who just got it. Uh, we have, I'm thinking of one right now who I often invite to our summit, uh, who you've heard on our podcast many times, uh, Mike Mitchell. You know, he, well, this guy is, he's been in the business for over four decades. He's seen pretty much everything you can think of from estate planning, business planning, you know, individual financial planning. These are the kinds of people who can help you. They have a long track record of providing great service and really innovative strategies, creative strategies. You know, it's very, very powerful. Anyway, if you're, if you're seeking advice, if you want a second opinion and you say, I'd like to talk to somebody there at follow the money who knows what they're doing. Well, just reach out to us, uh, follow the money.com forward slash contact right there. You can just reach out to us and say, Hey, would you connect me with, with somebody, you know, you know, that could give me a second opinion for free. Um, that's really the best way to do it, right? Just go to followthemoney.com forward slash contact. We'd love to put you in touch with somebody, uh, you know, who can help you with your financial goals. Okay. So there you go. Uh, tip number six, get a second opinion. Uh, it really can't hurt you. It really can't hurt at all. In fact, it can only help you. Uh, tip number seven, as we whittle down now to toward the very end of our eight tips for financial independence, uh, tip, tip number seven, guard your health, guard your health. Here's the truth. Healthcare costs can take a significant toll on your savings and they can potentially erode a lifetime of hard work. They can quickly destroy a lifetime of savings. That's why it's crucial to prioritize your health and to proactively set health goals to protect your financial future. So what can you do to guard your health and mitigate these kinds of risks? Well, let's talk about some actionable, actionable steps. You know, number one is to set some health goals that align with your aspirations. Incorporate exercises that you like to do. You know, one thing whenever I was young that I always had a problem with doing were pull-ups. I never could do a pull-up whenever I was a kid. I don't know about you, but I always struggled. I could do them, I could do them if I did them underhanded, you know, where, where my, my palms were facing me. But when I put my palms out and I grabbed the bar and I tried to pull up, I just couldn't do it. 
okay, well, as I've gotten older, you know, that became a thing like, I want to be able to do a pool, you know, and that, that was a, that was a really big goal for me. And you know what? You're never too old to go make those goals. You know, another thing that I really, really, really have been working on that I really want to do, this is going to sound silly, but I'm just telling you because I think it's neat is I want to do a 10 second handstand. You know how difficult those are just to do a regular handstand, but you know, it takes so much power in your core and in your body to be able to do a 10 second handstand. So you start thinking to yourself, well, what are some of the goals that I'd like to do? What are some of the things that I'd like to do, right? Uh, maybe you want to explore some breathing exercises. I love meditation. I love getting into a sauna. I love, uh, you know, uh, breathing exercises to reduce stress and enhance mental clarity. You can engage in regular cardio exercises, activities, keep your heart healthy. Uh, you can do resistance training to maintain muscle mass, right? You can, you can also really think about not just in terms of exercise, which is extremely important, but you can also think in terms of your, what you eat, what you put into your mouth. You know, this is a big deal in this country. I mean, obviously we have, you know, a very consumer driven society, but that consumption doesn't just, doesn't just mean like going out and buying stuff, but we actually buy garbage that we put into our bodies, you know? One of the biggest things that we eat too much of is just refined sugar. So today, I mean, back in the old days, when I say old days, I mean, I'm thinking like back to the 1980s, you know, where when you, if you wanted something that was sugar free, I mean, you were drinking like Tab Cola. Remember Tab? I mean, I'm kind of dating myself here, but my point is, you remember some of this stuff that it just was kind of tough to eat healthy, you know? Uh, Today, there's so many different. Uh, natural sweeteners that you don't have to use refined sugar for everything. You know, one of my favorite refined sugars is stevia. Or, or, not, not refined, a, a, a natural kind of sweetener, I'm sorry, is stevia. Stevia, I, for a long time, I held my nose up to it. I said, I don't, I don't like stevia. I'm a, I only want regular sugar. Well, over time, I was like, wait a minute, you know, sugar's not good for you. Let's find some alternatives. And I was amazed that you could find really great alternatives, for, even for cooking like xylitol and swerve. Although I'm not a big fan of swerve, I prefer xylitol. But stevia is one of my favorites now. I use it in coffee instead of honey or instead of sugar, you know, or I use it in tea or I use it in other things. Stevia is great. My point is, is that if you can reduce your consumption of refined sugars, well, you can really benefit your body, right? Because diabetes is like a really big problem. And that, and you may not think, well, what does that have to do with my money? Well, it has everything to do with your money, right? I mean, healthcare costs are outrageous. And if you have to enter the healthcare system because of poor diet or poor or lack of exercise, well, you're just costing yourself money that you may not have had to spend, Right. Another practice that I've taken on over the last few, uh, several years, been doing it now for many years, but uh, is intermittent fasting, you know, very powerful, um, which has shown promising health benefits for many individuals, including myself. I've seen great changes in my body. And what I do is I will eat typically from, say, about noon uh, till about six, okay? That, so about six hours for me. Uh, sometimes I go a little bit later. I, I try not to, but usually it's like 12 to six. And, uh, and that, you know, and therefore, you, you know, you, you try to eat good, but at the same time, you don't have to just eat, you know, vegetables. I mean, you can eat, you know, kind of whatever you want, but, but from 12 to six. And by doing that, you know, you allow your body in your, especially your stomach to rest and not constantly be working all day long, you know, at all times. And many people eat late and then go to bed and there's, you know, everything gets to rest except their digestive system. And all night long, their digestive system is working and doesn't get a break. You know, so eating really late at night can be bad too. But look, taking care of your body is important because it's the only place you have to live. You know, by investing in your health, you're not only safeguarding your well-being, but you're protecting your financial stability in the long run. So let's guard our health, huh? Let's act as if our health were the most valuable asset because really it truly is, right? It really is. So we can set health goals. We can engage in financial activi- uh, physical activities. We can embrace mindfulness practices. We can fast. We can uh, make conscious choices that support our overall well-being, especially when it comes to our diet. So really powerful strategy there. Uh, tip number seven, and that is to guard your health. And by doing that, you'll be guarding your wallet. That is really de- they are really hand in hand here. Okay, final tip, tip number eight. Uh, as we go through the eight different tips for achieving financial independence is to stay optimistic, to stay optimistic. 
Now, this is really important. I'm not saying to be unrealistic. I'm saying to stay realistically optimistic. (laughs) And so what I mean by this is fear, uncertainty, and doubt, also known as FUD, these are abundant in our world. They're abundant in our financial world for sure. And it's easy to get caught up in the noise, uh, the constant barrage of pessimistic voices that make even good news sound bad. But here's the secret to lasting financial success, staying the course and maintaining an optimistic mindset. Not again, I'm not telling you to be unrealistic. We have real problems here. Okay. We have real problems. We have real demographic problems here in the United States. We have uh, a ticking time bomb of debt. There's no doubt about it. We got real problems facing the country. Okay. But you're not going to be able to uh, make your financial world better by living in fear of that or by living in doubt uh, about that. You have to do something, right? So you have to go take care of your financial house. You can sit around and worry about the White House all day long, but you need to get your own financial house in order, right? That's the better, that's the better course of action. So the point is, is that, you know, oh, we need to stay optimistic realistically in the face of negativity and doubt, which is abundant. How do we do this? Well, it starts by acknowledging that the road to financial success may have bumps, may have hurdles. Stock market's not going to go straight up the whole time you're investing. Uh, Real estate market's not going to go straight up the whole time you're investing. Crypto market's not going to go straight up the whole time you're investing. You realize this. Instead, you just, you embrace a generally positive mindset and you tune out the noise of the eternal pessimists who are always going to have something negative to say. And you stay focused on your long-term goals. See, the pessimist sees difficulty in every opportunity. The optimist sees opportunity in every difficulty. So you can choose to be an optimist. You can choose to find opportunities where other people see challenges. You know, uh, this is really, really important. I, I, I think, you know, I'm kind of picturing in my mind as we're talking about this, like climbing a challenging mountain. You know, the path is steep, the air is thin, doubts arise. But every step brings you closer to that breathtaking view at the summit. And by staying optimistic, you keep moving forward. You keep overcoming obstacles and you keep reaching new heights of financial success. So optimism can be a powerful, powerful uh, lever for you in your financial journey. So in summation of point number eight is to ignore the noise, rise above the pessimism, stay the course. Remember that the best route to financial success is paved with positivity, determination, and a belief in your own abilities. Very, very powerful. So there we go. Eight tips for mastering your money and achieving financial independence in 2023. I hope you found these strategies practical, attainable, and inspiring. Remember, it's never too late to take charge of your financial future and build the life that you desire. You can implement these tips. You can stay disciplined. You can stay the course. You can do this. Well, as we come to the end of this empowering episode, I want to remind you of some wise words, as we always do with our final word, this time from the great Mark Twain, when he said, the secret to getting ahead is getting started. Today, we've explored eight powerful tips to help you master your money, achieve financial independence, and unlock the doors to a brighter future so that you can get ahead financially speaking. But here's the key. It's not enough to just listen and learn, now is the time to take action. You wanna implement these strategies into your life step-by-step and witness the transformative impact that they can have on your financial well-being. Embrace this moment as the catalyst for change and make the commitment to yourself and to your financial future. You can visit our website, followthemoney.com, where you'll find additional resources, tools, and support to guide you on your journey. And together, we can navigate the winding road to financial freedom. Remember, Every journey begins with a single step. Don't wait for the perfect moment. Start now and let your actions speak louder than your words. And as you make progress, celebrate each milestone and stay focused on the ultimate goal of financial independence. 
Thanks for joining me on this adventure. And remember, when you want the truth about the global economy, just follow the money. Have a safe and prosperous week, and I'll see you right back here next time. Until then, God bless. contained on the follow the money podcast is strictly for informational and educational purposes it should not be construed as specific investment advice the views and opinions of our guests and sponsors including tom cloud are their own and do not necessarily represent the views of ftmdaily.com or robinson media group llc jerry robinson does hold an insurance license and at times may offer consulting on life insurance and fixed retirement income products follow-up individualized responses to email or phone requests that involve the rendering of personalized investment advice for compensation will not be made absent compliance with state investment advisor registration requirements or an applicable exemption or exclusion and applicable insurance regulations past performance is not indicative of future results you should be aware of the real risk of loss in following any strategy or investment discussion on the podcast. Remember, never do your financial planning through podcast or radio. It's your money. Be wise. Do your due diligence and